okay, we're on page 24 in the uh, at the end of 24 in the treatise. I'm just going to pick it up and read from there uh, down towards the end of the page, the last couple paragraphs. For those of you who may, may have the treatise open and are following along. So uh, it says, the common law on arrest is the same in every state as due process of law has the same meaning throughout America. The security of the citizen's liberty in this country is to be more highly regarded than it was in England under the common law. To say it is less regarded is to make a mockery of the revolution. In a New Jersey case, a man was arrested by two city policemen on orders of their superior to do so, alleging that he was guilty of disorderly conduct and was taken to a police station and held overnight. This was done without any charge or complaint made against the man and without any warrant. The only authority for the rest was that the officers were told to do so. In a suit for false imprisonment, it was held by the Supreme Court of New Jersey that the arrest was without authority and gave the following opinion. Quote, the legal principle underlying this case and the one to be applied to the facts is firmly embodied in the roots of the common law which has been handed down to us from early times unimpaired in its full vigor. For the protection of personal liberty against illegal arrests, the liberty of the person is too important a matter to the state to be interfered with without the safeguards with which the law guards such invasions. This court has said the limits to the power of arrest by a constable without process was well defined at common law. The regard for liberty of the person was so great that the common law did not confer upon a mere conservator of the peace the power to touch the person of the subject of his own volition, except in those cases when the interests of the public absolutely demanded it." Close quote. In a Pennsylvania case, a woman was arrested for causing and procuring to be made loud and annoying sounds and noises at late hours of the night in a certain tent near a city street by beating upon a drum. Hmm. Upon indictment, her counsel moved that the indictment be quashed as she was arrested without affidavit and warrant while she was in a tent upon private property. It was held that the arrest was unlawful as the act was such that summary arrest was not justified and due process required a warrant for such arrest. Uh, this is from another court case, quote, it is the undoubted right of every person in this community not to be deprived of liberty without due process of law. And if the defendant has been arrested without due process of law, due process of law, the indictment against her cannot be sustained. It has long been recog recognized that arrests without warrant are justified in cases of treason, felony, or breach of the peace, in which actual or threatened violence is an essential element." Close quote. It must be remembered that not every misdemeanor involves a breach of the peace. Under the common law, acts that were malum per se, that is wrong or unlawful by their nature, were often felonies or breaches of the peace, and subject to arrest without warrant. But that is not the law for an act that was only malum prohibitum, being made unlawful only by statute and without such enactment were otherwise innocent acts. The law asserts that for such statutory mis misdemeanors not amounting to a breach of the peace, there is no authority in an officer to arrest without warrant. Court case quote, as a general principle, no person can be arrested or taken into custody without warrant. But if a felony or a breach of the peace has, in fact, been committed by the person arrested, the arrest may be justified. Close quote. While the search and seizure provision of the Constitution regulates the manner in which warrants can be issued, it is the due process clause which protects citizens from unlawful arrests without warrant. Court case site. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law and under like restrictions in the Constitution it has been held in some states that arrests shall not be made without warrant except for felonies and for 
breaches of the peace committed in the presence of the officer arresting, close quote. Thus, where an arrest is made without warrant, in a case not involving a felony or breach of the peace, the arrest is unlawful. Arrest without warrant, where a warrant is required, is not due process of law. An arbitrary or despotic power no man possesses under our system of government. Thus, when a police policy enforcer exceeds his powers in making an arrest, he becomes a trespasser, and he's liable for false imprisonment. That was from a court case. And then he gives a bunch of other authorities on the, on the issue. <clears throat> it's amazing how many cases there are regarding this very thing. Um, not only in this treatise, but some of the research that I've done uh, from each state. All right, so he's on conclusions. It is a maxim of law that liberty is more favored than all things. Thus the law favors liberty above all things and applies the most liberal interpretation to it. The common law rule regarding the procedure and process for arrest was established in this country. The Constitution has also provided that no one shall be deprived of liberty without due process of law and has provided that no warrant shall issue except upon oath or affirmation establishing probable cause. It has been settled for centuries, and the doctrine has been recognized here that except in cases of reasonable belief of treason or felony or breach of the peace committed in presence of an officer, there is no due process of law without a warrant issued by a court or magistrate upon a proper showing or finding. It's interesting they say here that if there's going to be a lawful warrant, um, it has to be issued upon oath or affirmation, establishing probable cause. So probable cause, I would figure what these policy enforcers do on the side of the road when they're mentioning statutes and that's their probable cause, well, it could even be, well, not argued, but the point could be made that even if they're going to do that, it has to be upon oath or affirmation to establish those points that they're making. Right? Would you all consider that correct? According to what it seems like this case is that I just read. So that's, um, a, good, that's a good thing to know. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's, it's, that's where the, they created a hole and drive a truck through it right there, is this um, sworn affidavit. Because where we saw it in Chris's arrest was, it was a, it said affidavit in support of a complaint. That affidavit has to be the man or woman coming forward who says you do wrong. And it's malum per se, per, per se, not prohibitum. It has to be malum, malum per se. It has to be not just an act that's prohibited. You don't need an oath or affirmation that a prohibited act, that i.e. a statute was violated. You need an affirmation, a sworn statement that it was a, a wrong had been committed, an actual you know, harm, injury, or loss to a real man or woman. So what they're doing is an affidavit by an officer or an agent of the of the state talking, giving an an an, an oath that a statute was violated. That's not law. That's color of law. Right. Right. But what I what I meant was um, that usually when we find ourselves in a situation where we're pulled over for some traffic offense in their eyes, and I think they're they're trying to find a way around because like, people are challenging them to give probable cause why this is even happening and my experience is that they'll just ramble off statutes well 
regardless whether they ramble off statutes or whatever, the probable cause, whatever it is, whether it's lawful or unlawful, has to be under oath or affirmation, according to this, this court case. Right? That's all I'm saying. So even if they're going to ra uh, ramble some statute in support of their probable cause, they still don't have grounds because it's not under oath or affirmation. But they go back and they, you know what they do, right? They make the cop the witness, and then he puts it on paper later, after the fact, after the arrest has already been executed. Yeah, right. But I'm, so it doesn't matter. I mean, their whole process is unlawful, you know, no matter how you look at it. Yep. No, I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't defending them. I was just saying. Yeah, I understand. The, yeah, the whole what I was trying to point out was the it's 180 degrees off of what it should be. That's right. that's really all I was saying. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I, one of the things people forget or everybody should know is the Clearfield Doctrine from 1941, and it simply says when the government enters commerce, they have no more sovereignty or rights than anybody else. They're the same as a as the person yeah so what is a synonym for traffic commerce so if I ever get stopped again I'm going to say some nice things to the officer and say oh does this have anything to do with traffic and he's going to pop up I'm sure and say yes and I'm going to ask him I say well are you trying to engage me in a commercial contract Oh, no, sir, we're not doing that. But well, you broke a statute, well, so. <laughs> a statute? What's a statute? <laughs> exactly. And statutes apply to all employees of, of corporations. Yeah, we well, can see that. The, the thing that you sent out, uh, uh, I think I stepped on you, Dave. Sorry about that. Go ahead. That's okay. I, I just said, you know, that... Statutes don't apply to me. You know, show me where the statute applies to me. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did that to a policy enforcer once, and he got so frustrated. He said, you're in my town. I'm the law. <laughs> hmm. Okay, do what you got to do. Yeah. And thank you very much. I enjoy, I enjoy your acceptance of my contract. Yeah, well, I didn't know all that back then. So all this is uh, well. Kind of I didn't either, but I I did do an administrative process on a guy that stopped me for driving on the shoulder of the road on a little podunk town in the middle of the night when the highway went from four lanes to two lanes, and I was in the four lane area, and I swung over and went in the two lanes, and I guess he was bored. And they were going to find me at that time. It was about fifteen twenty years ago. They were going to find me something like $300 for the thing. And I did an administrative hearing, and they were nice when they sent me the thing to come back to court. They had the, the officer's name on the, on the ticket. I got a copy of it. Then they had the, the mayor's name on it, the chief of police's name on it, and the clerk. So I just did an administrative process on all of them, told them they owed me $4,000 for time and effort, and I never heard back from them at all. <laughs> now, I don't know what they do in, in Alaska or Kansas, but here, my experience, they don't have you sign anything. They don't even give you any tickets. They just get whatever address they can off you, or if you don't oh, give it to them, then, they try to get it off your uh, VIN number, and they just send them to you. That's okay, too. They've still violated my copyrights and entered into a contract with me. But the other thing that I, I used, and I did get a, a ticket and showed up, and, and they uh, forgot me, and I had to tell them that I showed up because I got a statement that said I needed to be there. And I used Roger Elrich's thing. As I looked around, I said, does anyone here have a claim against me? And I looked at the judge. I said, judge, do you have a claim against me? And, oh, no, I don't have a claim against you. Maybe the prosecutor does. Huh. <laughs> and I looked at the prosecutor. I says, does anyone here have a claim against me? And he tried to crawl under the, the table over there. And I said, told the judge, I said, judge, it appears that no one has a claim against me. My business here is finished. 
I'm leaving. I demand that the record report be released to me immediately. And I walked out the door, and she screamed at me, We will get your license! whoop de doo <sighs> That's... They, if if you if you know how to to work with them, they they don't have a leg to stand on, really. Oh yeah, I know. But like I said, this is a whole different ball game. This is actually holding them accountable. So they need to be held accountable. At least I think they do. <laughs> um, I'm sure everyone on this call would agree. Yep. Yep. And there's ways to do that too. Oh, we know that. What you're going you're going to explain to us? So go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, it's okay. I was just going to say it's they. It, there's so many levels that they just uh, violate and just don't follow what, what the law says. I mean, it's not it's not only on one or two things. It's it's on multiple levels that they they just you know end up kicking themselves in the rear end. Um, but anyway, uh, to continue on. So it, it is thus fundamental that the due process clause of the Constitution protects the citizen from unlawful arrests. That was a quote from another case. Uh, by the common law, which is the law, which is that law due process guarantees, a citizen cannot be summarily, summarily arrested when he is found violating a law that is only a misdemeanor. A warrant must first be acquired to arrest such a person pursuant to due process of law. If that which constitutes due process of law is made to depend upon the will of the legislature as expressed in a statute or charter, then no fundamental principles of law or rights are perpetrated or secured against abrogation. An arrest is a deprivation of one's liberty. The state constitution requires that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And he quotes the Minnesota um, Article 1, Section 7 of the Minnesota Constitution. Um, Maria, what does it say in the Alaska Constitution? Usually in the, in the first article. In an Article 1, usually the first few sections. Do you know what it is about, offhand? About uh, arrest? Uh, about being deprived of life, liberty, property, without due process of law. Does it have something like that in the Alaskan Constitution? Yeah, there's a due process. Uh, I, they've broken it up into a couple clauses, maybe. I'd have to go and look and read it verbatim. Okay, but you know what's <laughs> in there. They, they're usually in, you know, Article One, usually in the first several sections. What about in Kansas, Dave? I'm sure they have something. Yeah, it's pretty much just like the, the National Constitution. They're yeah, okay, guaranteed life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. All right, I'm going to continue on. The procedure for arrest under the common law is what constitutes due process today. As the Minnesota Supreme Court held, what is due process of law is usually a traditional or historical question. Was it due process of law under the common law, and did it remain such up until the time of adopting the Constitution? Close quote. The law is very jealous of the liberty of the citizen. Where the offense is less serious, the greater the formality prescribed for the exercise of the power which can deprive the citizen of his liberty. That was another quote, court case quote. Uh, the citizen cannot be summar summarily deprived of his liberty because of his infraction of subordinance or statute, unless at common law he was liable to arrest. The misdemeanor traffic statute involved in this case is such that it does not allow the defendant to arrest the plaintiff without the formality of a warrant. Therefore, the defendant is guilty of false imprisonment for arresting the plaintiff without authority of law. The foregoing proves that the common law surrounding arrest was always recognized in this country and is thus the requirement for due process in depriving the plaintiff of his liberty. It is the law of the land. As such, these principles are constitutional mandates and cannot be abrogated by mere statutes. And it says, respectfully submitted and stated jurors et de jour by and his name and address. So does anybody know what jurors et de jour means? Neither do I. I didn't look it up. It's got something with law. 
law and righteous what is uh law and lawful that's probably what it means in latin juris meaning law i don't know if et is an de jure is lawful correct by law yeah of law uh, of law of, yeah um uh, what where are we what page uh and the pdf it says 27 uh Okay. At the end of 27, in the actual PDF, I think it's 25, page 25, the bottom. Okay. Or do you have a hard copy, or are you on a computer? I'm on the computer right now. Okay. Are you at that spot? Um, 25, page 25, it says. Yeah, at the oh. bottom, it says page 13 of 13, plaintiff's memorandum on arrest without warrant. At the bottom of the page. Uh, the next section is like is chapter four, breach of the peace oh, yeah. and arrests. Okay, juris a and of law. Juris is um, jurisdiction is the maybe it's law and of law. Law and of law. Yeah. Respectfully submitted, stated. I, I don't know what that phrase is, is all about, though. It probably has a... I'll have to look and see if I can find it. Let me do a quick search here. Let me break out a page on the Internet. Good old Internet. Juris et de jure. Uh -huh. uh, a phrase employed to denote conclusive presumptions of law which cannot be rebutted by evidence. The words huh. signify of law and from law. You were close there, Maria. Hmm. That only of counts law in and from law. Yeah, but close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's another one. It says of law and of right. We know it's a good thing. I don't know if I'd use that in my paperwork if I ever had to do this. Um, anyway, Dave, are you following along on, on the computer, or do you have a hard copy, or are you just listening? I'm just listening. I can't run my computer and talk on the phone at the same time. Okay. I have a hot spot on my phone, and if I run the computer, it shuts the phone off. Okay. So I'm just listening. But you know what that sounds like is, is a maxim of law. The Latin phrase. The Latin phrase. Yeah, well, what that yeah, juris et de jure. Et de jure. Said, yeah. Yeah. That sounds like basically they're they're saying it's a maxim, you know, because that's the only thing I know of that can't be questioned or adjudicated. Well, may, maybe a personally sworn affidavit process, because an affidavit is prejudicial and non-judicial. Yeah, I don't I don't bother with Latin stuff anyways. You know, I don't need to sound legalese. Anyways, um All right, so That's we're starting Roman, Roman civil law, you know, basically all that comes from. Yeah, it's part of legalese. That's, it's part of their word salad yeah. confusion. Yep. All right, chapter 4. Breach of the peace and felony arrest. So I guess um Mr. Weissman's going to, I don't mean Mr. Weissman in a legal sense, is getting into the nitty-gritty of what is, obviously it starts off here, what is a breach of the peace? Um, so these policy enforcers and these corporate employees can't just make up something. All right, so a breach of the peace may be generally defined as a violation of the public order, which amounts to a disturbance of the public tranquility, or by inciting others to do so. It is clear that not every misdemeanor is a breach of the peace. To constitute a breach of the peace, there must be some violence or harm existing or threatened to occur to person, property, health, or morals. A phrase, assaults, riotous conduct, or destruction of property make up the largest part of what can be called a breach of the peace. Let me say that again. A phrase, assaults, 
riotous conduct or destruction of property make up the largest part of what can be called a breach of the peace. What did we say was a, a, a phrase last time? Fighting in a public place that disturbs the peace. Did you guys know what an, an affray was? Yep, just from this, just from reading this. Yeah. A phrase, kind of like a ruckus. Yeah, I just looked it up. It's Dis, public disorderly, fight. disorderly conduct, disorderly conduct. Yeah. And I'd say probably what happened on January 6th was more of a, a phrase or than a, an insurrection. That's neither here nor there. All right, continuing on. Thus, in the majority of cases of breach of peace, some actual violence is present. In some states, there has been attempts to exp expand the meaning of breach of peace to include all indictable misdemeanors. But this but this, it must be confessed, is doing serious violence to a simple expression, easily and well understood. Some of the types of breaches of the peace are described as follows. A breach of the peace includes acts of public turbulence, acts of violence or tending to produce violence, or tending to incite violence, disturbance of the public tranquility by yelling, hollering, or uttering loud and vociferous language, <laughs> making disturbing noises on a public street by one in a state of intoxication, wanton discharge of firearms in a public place, engaging in a fray or public fighting or in an assault, uttering abusive, profane, indecent, or otherwise provocative language. That's pretty distinct. In discussing what constitutes a breach of the peace, the Supreme Court of North Carolina held a breach of the peace is a public offense done by violence or one causing or likely to cause an immediate disturbance of public order. Breaches of the peace are acts which are malum in se, being wrongful or evil by their nature. Thus, acts which are malum prohibita are those acts made wrong merely by a statute cannot be classed as a breach of the peace. Huh. So there's a difference between malum in se and malum prohibita. I guess malum in, malum in se has got to do with breaking the law, which malum prohibita is dealing with statutes. So if it's breaking a statute, it cannot be classed as breach of the peace. That's interesting. Those yeah, Malum, Malum and Say is obviously, I, I always say Malum per se, but I guess it's in say. In and, in and of itself, it's, it's wrong. But Malum prohibita is just prohibited acts. So, yeah, statute. It's good to know. Those acts which constitute a breach of peace have been settled throughout the course of the common law. The legislature cannot declare any act they choose to be a breach of the peace. The nature of the act determines if it fits the common law definition of a breach of the peace. The acts that are only malum prohibita include liquor prohibition laws, traffic laws, labor laws, health laws, food laws, building codes and zoning ordinances, safety acts, game laws, and very many other police regulations. Without a statute, most of the acts constituting these offenses would be innocent acts. Ah. Yeah, you know that scripture in Psalm 9420? How should the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, seeing you frame mischief by a law? That's what statutes are. They're just framing mischief, making criminals out of everybody. All right, we continue on. A, par a parade on the street is not of itself a breach of the peace, though it could constitute one. The carrying of arms in a quiet, peaceable, and orderly manner concealed on or about the person is not a breach of the peace. Nor does such an act of itself tend to a breach of the peace. A mere trespass is not a breach of the peace and does not impose criminal liability upon the wrongdoer. 
Driving an automobile while intoxicated constitutes a breach of peace. Indecent exposure is where one is walking in public naked or nearly naked, or an indecent dress is disruptive of the morals of society and constitute constitutes a breach of the peace. Blasphemy of Christ or Christianity in public is a breach of the peace. Huh. Interesting. Wow. A lot of people could be litigated against on just that alone. A mere violation of public decorum or penal law does not constitute a breach of peace. Conduct merely amounting to a nuisance is not per se a breach of peace. The sale of 15 dynamite caps to a 15-year-old boy did not constitute a breach of peace. A theft is not in its nature a breach of the peace. A charge of disorderly conduct is a broader term than a, than a breach of the peace because a person who commits a breach of the peace is necessarily guilty of disorderly conduct, but all disorderly conduct is not necessarily a breach of the peace. Now, all these things that I'm reading, he's gotten from a bunch of court cases. Obviously, Maria, you can see down there at the bottom of the page as footnotes. Um, uh-huh. A uh, breach of the peace is a common law offense, but is not in itself a specific offense. Thus, in a charge or indictment, the, sub the specific offense must be specified. Arrest for breach of the peace. In the struggle for government to claim and exercise greater powers of arrest, it has unlawfully attempted to apply the common law rule for a breach of peace arrest to all misdemeanor misdemeanors. The general rule of law under the common law for the arrest of misdemeanor offenses amounting to a breach of the peace is stated as follows. In cases of misdemeanor, a peace officer, like a private person, has a common law, no power of arresting without a warrant, except when a breach of the peace has been committed in his presence or there's reasonable ground for supposing that a breach of peace is about to be committed or renewed in his presence. An arrest can only be made to suppress and prevent the breach of peace, and if the act ceases, there's no longer justification for the arrest without warrant. Court, Kate, court case quote, a constable cannot arrest, but when he sees an actual breach of peace, and if the affray be over, he cannot arrest, and where a breach of the peace has been committed and was over, the constable must proceed in the same way as any other person, namely by obtaining a warrant from a magistrate. So the arrest is only temporary, according to these court case quotes. The rule for arrest without warrant involving misdemeanors was stated in an article in the Michigan Law Review as follows. Neither O, a peace officer, nor C, a private citizen, may arrest D, a person, for M, a misdemeanor, which is not a BP, a breach of the peace. In regards to this rule, it was stated, another court case, quote, Neither an officer nor a citizen may arrest for a misdemeanor, which does not amount to a breach of the peace, even though it occurs in his presence. As, for example, talking loudly in the street in the presence of the officer who ordered the parties to be quiet, an arrest without a warrant was not justified. Nor where D, in the presence of O, D was, who was D? He was a person in the presence of the officer was turning toward the wall for a particular purpose of relief in the street or where he was disturbing a public meeting or obstructing the free passage across a bridge or refusing to move on a sidewalk at the request of an officer or fraudulently substituting a smaller for a larger check or fraudulently evading payment of a railroad fare or maintaining a billboard on a sidewalk, or insulting the head of the house in the presence of his family, or assembling to witness a Sunday ball game or a movie show. Wow. It is a common rule that an officer cannot arrest for a breach of peace after it has ended. When a breach of the peace ceases, the reason for the arrest ceases, that being to stop or prevent the breach of public order. Mr. Bishop, in his treatise on criminal procedure, speaking on the subject of arrest for breaches of the peace, says, 
After the tumult is over, with no prospect of its renewal, it is too late to interfere without judicious process. And other past misdemeanors are within the same rule, namely that a private person or even an officer cannot, without a warrant, arrest one for a misdemeanor committed on an occasion already passed. The principle behind the common law of rule of arrests was that in order to prevent harm, violence, or disturbance to the public peace, it is necessary that those perpetrating such acts be promptly stopped by arrest. Where, however, the offense is in an accomplished fact, its prevention is no longer possible. Also, a public order has been fully restored before the officer appears, the power to arrest without warrant for a misdemeanor, breach of the peace, no longer exists for the end by which such authority to arrest is allowed. To maintain the public peace is no longer attainable. That was from a court case. Here's another court case. The occasions which would justify arrest without process for vagrancy would indeed be very rare, as much as it involves no immediate danger to public or private security. Close quote. Under American common law, no one can be required to give an account of themselves or to show they have a visible means of support or that they have employment. As part of the right to life, all have a right to choose how to live and how to support themselves, and no government act can interfere with this right. The majority of misdemeanor offenses would not fall in this, the class of a breach of the peace, which allow the immediate intervention of authority by arrest as they are not an offense of a grave nature or because they do not actually disturb the public peace. An arrest for breach of the peace in the officer's presence must be made promptly, either at the time of the offense or as soon as the circumstances permit. If the officer does not act immediately after the offense has been committed, he can thereafter make arrests only by procuring a warrant. When an officer, after having seen a breach of the peace committed, departs on other business or for other purposes and afterwards returns, he cannot, without warrant, make an arrest for the offense. But where the officer finds it necessary to procure assistance, a reasonable time may be employed in the pursuit. In such a case, the officer must at once set about the arrest and follow up the effort until the arrest is effected. An unreasonable delay will make the arrest invalid. In order to justify a delay, there should be a continued attempt on the part of the officer to make the arrest. It has been erroneously stated that officers are authorized to break in a house or building to prevent the commission of any crime without a warrant. This is an invalid exaggeration of the true law in the matter, which is revealed as follows. The authority of a constable to break open doors and arrest without a warrant is confined to cases where treason or felony has been committed, or if there is an affray, public fighting, or a breach of the peace in his presence. And he states some resources there that he got it from. The cases in which a breach of the peace occurs in the presence of an officer when done in the building would be very rare. The cases of felony and treason in such a case would most often occur where the felon was pursued into a building by the officer. Uh, public drunkenness unaccompanied by language or conduct which creates a breach of the peace will not justify arrest without a warrant. Impudent, abusive, or offensive language addressed to a peace officer does not tend to breach the peace, even though it may provoke the officer to anger. It has been held that the mere refusal to give one's name and address does not justify the incarceration of a citizen. Uh, threatened breach of the peace. An officer cannot arrest because he thinks or has suspicions that a breach of the peace might be committed. The cause for arresting upon such cases must be when a breach of the peace is threatened or its occurrence is imminent. In determining when officers may interfere by an arrest to prevent a threatened breach of the peace, the Supreme Court of Michigan stated, we are of opinion that a threat or other indication of a breach of the peace will not justify an officer and making an arrest. Unless the facts are such as would warrant the officer in believing an arrest is necessary to prevent an immediate execution thereof, as where a threat is made coupled with some overt act and attempted execution thereof. 
The object of permitting an arrest under such circumstances is to prevent a breach of the peace where the facts show danger of its being immediately committed. Excuse me for a second. I'm back. Thus, the interposition of the officer in a threatened breach of the peace is not for the purpose of an arrest, but to prevent a disturbance of breach of the peace under a present menace of violence. Court case site. Quote, the courts are almost unanimous in their holdings that a threatened breach of the peace will not justify an arrest without warrant, unless the facts as such as would warrant the officer in believing an arrest necessary to prevent an immediate execution thereof as where the threat is made coupled with some overt act and attempted execution thereof. In such cases, the officer need not wait until the offense is actually committed. The guideline then for making arrests on what is to be called a threatened breach of the peace is when the conditions are such that the threatened breach of peace is imminent and that it is obvious to the average person that it is going to occur, as held by the Supreme Court of North Carolina, quote, we think a breach of the peace is threatened if the offending person's conduct under the surrounding facts and circumstances is such as reasonable, justifies the belief that the perpetration of an offense amounting to a breach of the peace is imminent. Close quote. Since the nature of most breaches of the peace is such that cause violence to person or property, the acts which constitute them are apparent so that no one could readily see or hear them occurring. It is said a breach of peace is committed in one's presence when by the use of his senses he knows of its commission by the person about to be arrested. Thus an arrest for a breach of the peace may be made when one's senses afford him knowledge that it is being committed, whether through sight, hearing, or other senses. Close quote. An arrest for a breach of the peace cannot be made on suspicion or mere belief. Court case site, quote, an arrest for a breach of the peace cannot be justified merely upon belief or suspicion existing in the mind of the officer, but where the actions of the person and the surrounding circumstances are such as to indicate a threatened breach of the peace, the arrest may be lawfully made, close quote. It is thus said that an officer cannot arrest for a misdemeanor or a breach of the peace based solely upon information from another or sus suspicion without a warrant. In no case could advice or information given after the arrest was made justify the arrest. Likewise, an arrest cannot be made for one purpose and justify for another. Um, I think I'm going to end there because the next part, it gets into conditions of felony arrests. So it just, well, you know what? Actually, I will read it because I thought it went longer. Uh, it's just a little bit longer than, than uh, Chapter 5 starts, so I'll just read this short section, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a night. Uh, conditions of felony arrest. It was regarded under the common law to be a right and a duty for a citizen to arrest one he sees committing a felony without a warrant, as stated by Justice Platt. All persons, whatever, who are present when a felony is committed or dangerous wound is given are bound to apprehend the offenders. To arrest a person for a felony not witnessed by the officer, he must be able to conclude from the facts then existing that a certain person did commit the felony so that any prudent person would be led to believe likewise. An arrest for felony based upon suspicion, belief, or rumor can never be justified for any cause whatsoever, not even by a warrant can such an arrest be lawful. Uh, court case site, quote, where there is a felony and it is passed, the officer is justified in arresting, though no offense has been committed, yet he must have had reasonable cause to suspect the one apprehended. Close quote. To allow arrest for suspicions, even in the case of felony, would make everyone susceptible to arrest who the officer might choose to believe to be a likely or possible perpetrator of the crime. Well, that goes on a lot today, doesn't it? It would be, in effect, amount to a general warrant in the hands of any officer, a concept which was found to be so abhorrent to the founding fathers of the American Revolution. 
All arrests for felonies not seen or witnessed by the officer or citizen making the arrest have the burden to justify the arrest. In a felony arrest by a private citizen, he must justify the arrest by showing that the felony had actually been committed and that he had reasonable grounds for believing the person arrested to be guilty. An officer is required only to show the probable cause existing for making the arrest and need not show that a felony actually occurred, though such proof could serve as a justification. In all other arrests, probable cause is not a factor in justifying an arrest without warrant. What's he saying here? Let me repeat that again. An officer is required only to show the probable cause existing for making the arrest and need not show that a felony actually occurred, though such proof could serve as a justification. In all other arrests, probable cause is not a factor in justifying an arrest without warrant. I wonder what, they mean, what he means by in all other arrests. Huh. It is well settled at common law that an officer or private person without warrant may lawfully seize and detain another in cases where a felony was about to occur. Court case quote, if two persons be fighting and there be reason to fear that one of them will be killed by the other, it will be lawful to part and imprison them till their anger shall be cooled. And private persons may justify breaking and entering the plaintiff's house and imprisoning his person to prevent him from murdering his wife, close quote. So that seems to be the information on breaches of the peace and felony arrests. Let's see here. Boy, we went through a lot there. It is a little bit confusing. I have to read that over again and figure out exactly what the differences are. It seems like there's, there's a contradiction right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing I could think of when he says, in all other arrests, probable cause is not a factor in justifying an arrest without a warrant. Yeah, that, that's a... I don't know what he means by that. Well, the only thing I can think of is the only other arrest justifiable without a warrant is a breach of the peace committed in his presence. So he saw it, so he doesn't have probable cause. He saw it. It's, he's, got, he's a witness. I mean... I don't know. I, I, it's, good, it's good to be aware of this, but... I, I think I could be pretty confident that we're not going to find ourselves in any of these situations. You know, committing felonies well, and, and breaches of the peace. You know, I was thinking of the the revolution that happened in the country this summer. All of these breaches of the peace were right in front of people. The fires, the tearing down of statues, the, the um, public breaches of peace. And no one went and made any arrest, but they could have. But they waited. They asked the police to do it. And the police, for some reason, you know, whatever reason, the, the police wouldn't get involved. But these could have all been, um, you know, properly executed under citizen arrest. Because you don't need a warrant to, to arrest. And, and you we're also... Situations. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Is that so, is I, that something you could see yourself doing? Yeah. There's there is. Um, I I can. When you get the the law from your state on what you are supposed to say and do when you're placing someone under citizen's arrest, it gives you a lot of confidence about how to do it. You know and. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like that might have been a test um, to see exactly how many Americans were aware of their rights. You know, when people are actually running roughshod and burning things down and doing all kinds of property damage, is there anyone else out there, if you have control of the policing agencies, is there anyone else out there who's empowered to do this 
and again, I think it's a duty that we've just lost contact with. Well, I told you I'm reading this uh, this law on the sheriffs. Oh yeah. Mhm. And it says the sheriff can solicit um, the citizens. I use that loosely to aid him in making arrests or rounding up perpetrators. Mm-hmm. That's, one, that's one of the sheriff's duty of being the county, the, the county keeper. That's sure. What, it seems like sheriff means according to anyway to this publication. Oh, that's interesting. The county, county keeper. Yeah, county we, keeper. Um, the only reason the police have the right to arrest is because they've gotten it from the people. So it's another one of those things we've kind of forgotten. They don't have any... They don't have any rights without us, you know, without the consent of the governed. And if they have the right, we must have given it to them. So we certainly have it as well, as long as we follow the law. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would be an interesting thing to dissect, considering we're dealing with corporations. So how much authority do they really have considering they're just corporate pretty much corporate security guards where where does that where does the line of their corporate duties end and then the constitutional duties begin i believe the answer is in the trust whatever trust is being acted upon at that moment Is, is there evidence for that? Yeah, you sent it to me. I'm, I'm just saying uh, actual, those, actual, those, actual that's evidence. That's not evidence. That's not evidence. That's, uh, po- he's positing, yeah. isn't he? So that's not actually proof. Right. It's not proof. It's, it's evidence, but it's not proof. Yeah. Um, I well, do they'd have, have... They'd have to prove on their end where they get the delegated authority to even do the things that they're doing outside of their corporate status. Well, there is a book. I do have a book by Ron McDonald that I'm going through it again. To, um, I think I told you about it, Own It All by Means of Toxic Currency. And they talk about, I don't know if they talk about the Federal Reserve notes as being a trust and there's split title and all that or not. But it's, it's, it's a really... Um, we know that all the courts are operating in equity, and that that really does explain well how how that could have come to be. If it, it's a it's a theory, but it it fits it fits the uh, what we're seeing on the ground. So, well, I've read and I heard some people. I don't remember exactly where. Um, by the way, that link that you sent with Ronald. Mc- Ronald McDon Ronald McDonald is that his name? Ron McDonald. Yeah, Ron McDonald. Ron McDonald. Uh huh. I just think of McDonald's when I say that name. You know, like the yeah. fast food restaurant. Anyways, uh, that link that you sent, <laughs> I ended up listening to that. The one that on uh, Walls of Our Minds or something like that with um, Terry Dodd. Uh huh. Yeah, but it didn't have taking standing under a beneficial public interest, did it? No. I don't I remember him going I over know. that. I know. I listened to it again later after I sent it. I have to find the other one where he, he's he been on there about five times, and I thought I had them all on my my own talk shoe, and I don't, so I've got to find that. But that's the only place I've ever heard it was from him, and I don't know that he gave the reference either. Well... But. What I was going to say was I've heard people, go in, when they go into court, they end up talking about the trust, how they end up making it a point that the judge and the prosecutor are trustees and that they're the beneficiary, and then it, and it gets all turned around um, where the case gets dropped because the scheme has been exposed. I don't know how. I mean, it makes sense to me. Um also, too, I don't know where I heard it that the uh, usually the prosecutor takes out a bond 
Because usually if he right. loses the case, he has to pay. I don't remember where I heard that. That might have been on the Stop the Pirates. Because he was talking about the bid bond, payment bond, and how he how he grabbed the bonds before he left. Uh, it was one of the articles on Stop the Pirates. Yeah. And it was just too... It was too vague to really, you can't really implement that. But it's just, you know, it's just a tiny piece of the puzzle in helping us, I think, to understand how how the trust and the, how come, you know, I, I, he, he does kind of describe it. Somebody was just recently describing it as, you know, blind men trying to tell you what an elephant was like. Yeah, and I've heard that he, a couple of times. Yeah, so, so it's it's it is it fits the it fits, but it may not be the only thing going on. Um, so it's it we uh, so we keep going, you know, we yeah. keep going and trying to figure out, you know, and to some degree we keep experimenting. And finding out what works, but yeah, Alfred Adask even talks about how this, since the man in the black robe has total discretion, what might reward you and give you remedy is not going to give remedy to, to the next guy that comes along. So, you know, it might, it's just his discretion that's giving that remedy at the moment or, or giving that innocent verdict or whatever it is and it makes sense that it's it's a moving target because that seems to be their the best um, seems to be their best strategy is to have ha, always have a moving target yeah well you know Marie you've heard me say it ad nauseum you know I think the, the simple way of just putting the notices in like Carl Lentz recomm uh, recommends, I think that's just the simplest way just to neutralize the court without all this other stuff. I, I don't think all this other stuff is necessary on the defensive position. You know, I, I, that's just that's just my point of view. Um, so well, to some degree, Carl understood this stuff. He understood when I discover something new, I. I figure out what, how Carl Lentz implemented it. He implemented it without really explaining it, though. Like he talked, always talked about remaining in honor. I wish to remain in honor. Well, that has everything to do with what we're seeing in equity. As long as, and you know, if you, if you, there are people out there talking a lot about equity now. Well, that is the main condition you want to have be able to meet is remaining in honor. <laughs> and showing up to settle debts or whatever. So, yeah, it's it comes from this equity law that Carl understood and kind of passed along. There's all that ruckus in the background. Sorry, I thought I was muted. <laughs> and who would this be that just jumped on the call? Oh, this is Chris. Sorry, I just got in. I was writing a letter to the governor. Okay, hey Chris, <laughs> how's it going? Uh, we're we're pretty much uh, wrapping it up. We were just discussing um, some stuff. Uh, yeah, does anybody um want to raise any issues here or go over anything? So next week will be the section defenses to unlawful arrest. So this would be this would be really good. Um, like I said, Chris, because you got on so late, um, what I'm putting together is the paperwork from this treatise that Charles A. Weissman apparently he used in his case, and just making some tweaks to it. I'm going to send it to Maria, and she could 
send it out, and it'll, I think it'll be a good template for people to use if they want to um, in their own cases. A uh, good idea of what what to do. Um, it's, it seems like pretty simple paperwork. A little expensive, but it seems pretty simple and straightforward. Um, Excellent. I look forward to seeing what you get together. Yeah, it's it's pretty much just what he did. I just like the captioning of the the paperwork. I just changed a little bit. Um, but have I know Chris? You, did you go through the streetus already? Uh, yeah, I've been through it um, probably a couple of times now. <laughs> one just re more recently, but once a while back. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it's necessary to keep referring back to it because there's there's, uh, there's just a bunch of good stuff in it. The one thing I just I uh, for myself to be cautious on is just there's so many court cases that are referenced, and to me, I don't know if it's really necessary to reference so many court cases. Um, I've heard some people uh, don't even do that at all, um, and I would just warn, or you know, to be on the cautious side is, you know, if, if a court case is going to be cited in one's paperwork, uh, we just can't like cut and copy and paste it from you know other paperwork. I mean, it's a matter of going through these court cases, so. Uh, Maria and uh, Chris, have you done any research on the court cases that are cited in this treatise? I can't say I've delved into many of them. I've just gone and done a few, um, you know, just finding Justia or Find Law just to see if they're there. Right. You know, and these, a lot of these, um, well, a lot of the stuff I run across comes up over and over and over again in Patriot paperwork, you know, so a lot of them are known, uh, Miranda versus Arizona and, and uh, Trinzi versus Pagliaro and, you know, Clearfield Doctrine and all of these different ones come up over and over and over again, and they're definitely there. So I haven't gone through every every one of these, of course, but I have gone through a few of them. Because there, there's been a few cases where I've come across and I've tried researching them and couldn't find the cases, or or the, the cases themselves didn't have the particular quote that that was being used. So yeah, I'm. I'm I'm kind of leery in, in 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 doing that. If I if I did do it, it'd only be probably two or three court cases per point. Um, going by the biblical doctrine of, you know, on, on the word of two or three witnesses, every matter matter shall be established. Dave, what, do you have any experience with that at all? I mean, have you gone through any of the cases in this treatise or research just to maybe verify some of them? Not really. Now, what do you guys think about use, putting cases in paperwork? Have you heard about people avoiding that? Yeah, definitely. For for one, you don't want to invoke that jurisdiction, so you put it in brackets, to, you know, compare CF, compare my law to your law, and it's just, uh, you, you just, you know, like in your notices where you, Keep it really simple and just bring up the the very concise part of the law that you want to talk about, and then if there's something that you wanted to say, this is my belief. You're basically saying this is the common law side, and I'll give you, you know, I'll supply you with your belief too if you need me to. And that's the legal side, and you put it in brackets, so it's so you're not invoking that jurisdiction. That's that's what I've heard. What about putting them in exhibits? Yep, yep, and and uh, same thing. Though the exhibit, you're still putting them in brackets and not. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that Gus and Carl have done to really be clear that they're not invoking that jurisdiction. Yeah. 
you know, kind of almost like tripping over yourself to make it clear. And I think a lot of that's lost on some of these folks. They don't get it. Um, it's so simple, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah, that's it can't what, be that easy. <laughs> yeah, right. Can't be, can't be that simple. Let's let's complicate this a little. Yeah, one sentence. That's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> what I learned while I was in prison was the the strength and power of an affidavit. Everybody that I talked to out here, they put their affidavits into the court. But my roommate pointed out to me when I was in prison, one of the maxims of law is under. Uh, twill, all it takes is an affidavit to open a case. That's like an indictment, your affidavit. And you use the maxims of law, and one of those maxims of law is an affidavit is prejudicial and non-judicial. It never goes to a court. A judge can't look at it. That's one of the maxims. It's strictly a one-on-one, these are what I charge you with, defendant. And an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth and judgment. Yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, I think um, being aware or using maxims of law would be um, good to put in paperwork. Well, we did We did one. I had some problems. I, I got a guy $137,000 by writing an affidavit because of of basically what they did to him, um, deprivation of rights or due process. They were trying to get him to pay for a hand that they broke when they were arrested him. And uh, he was $15,000 as a hospital bill. And uh, I said, why don't you use the affidavit? He didn't know what I was talking about. So I wrote a three-page a- affidavit and within 10 days, we had a reply back from the city cops that arrested him. The city attorney was offering $137,000 to drop the case. Wow. Was he able to collect? I don't know. He got transferred. I was, after I got him, at, uh, the nice guy got into my paperwork and and messed up all my my paperwork that I had, stole some documents that now I can't go back and recreate them. That's one of the reasons I haven't done anything in my case. But I used the affidavit, and while I was in prison, and, and got the warden. You know, he was a good guy. I had nothing against him, but a couple of of the guards. Uh, were harassing me, so I did an affidavit against them and it ended up the warden left. His family was high up in the prison system and he immediately transferred to a different prison. So what do you think about declarations as a, as opposed to affidavits? Well, uh, an affidavit is a declaration of truth and fact. And an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth and judgment. There's an unrebutted affidavit. It's, it stands as, as fact and judgment. And whatever, what people mess, mess up when they write their affidavit, they never put any remedy in there. They just put the facts down, and, and you can put down all the facts you want. You know, say, these people lied to me, they beat me, they cheated me, they, you know, did all this stuff. And they don't respond. So yeah, it's all true. All those are facts. But they never put down any remedy, you know. The, the essence of, of breaking the law, first of all, you have to break the law. Secondly, there must be an injured party. Third, the injured party states their claim and restitution they demand. And fourth, it has to be you have to prove intent. And that's how you set up the affidavit, you know. Use the twill thing, uh, uh, that, that case that says it only takes an affidavit to start a case. You've got about seven or eight maxims of law there, you know. One of them is a 
an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth and fact, and it, an affidavit is prejudicial and non-judicial. The only way it can be overridden is with a common law jury. Pretty powerful. And you know, that's Rule 56 of the Civil Rules of Procedure. Rule 55 tells you how to, how to perfect that thing once you get your judgment against an individual or against the United States. Against an individual, all you need is a clerk of the court to stamp it. It's against the, the United States. You need a judge's signature on your on your affidavit after you, you complete your affidavit process. You, know, you do your original affidavit, give them seven to 30 days to respond. When they don't, then you still have a notice of fault with right to cure. Uh, when they don't respond there, you send out notice of default and consent to judgment. Put those together, take it down to any clerk of the court and have them stamp it, and there's your perfected judgment. Now, have I ever done that? Nope, because they messed up my paperwork. How would you collect on that the hard I mean, if you did go through it? Well, how does anybody collect on any judgment? I don't know. If the, if, if the judge says you owe us $10,000 or you owe, you go to a small claims court and the, small, and the judge says you didn't pay your rent or whatever, you owe this guy $3,000, how do you collect on it? Take it to the sheriff. Send veto out. In the county, in, in the county where the in the county where the, their property is located. You know, 